Hi, welcome to the second session of our study as Suffering God in a Suffering World. In the last session, we talked about the meaning of suffering. The key premise of our discussion was that suffering ceases to be suffering when it has a meaning. Now, religions find different ways to attribute meaning to human suffering. And we looked at three categories of meaning predominantly, uh, retributive, retroactive, and redemptive. I hope you remember that. Uh, today, we are going to ask a very fundamental question. Who is the author of evil? Who is responsible for all the suffering in this world? Uh, first, there is a moral evil we face in the world, uh, which results from human actions like uh, a war or a terrorist attack or something like that. Then there is natural evil, which is an event apparently beyond our control, like a flood or a drought or, or a pandemic. Now, isn't it true to say that God is somehow responsible for all this evil and suffering? And it's a good question. It only makes sense to say that if there is a God who is in charge of this world, he should take the blame for all the bad things happening in the world. At least some blame to be attributed to God. I totally, totally agree with that. But here is the twist. Did you know that the Bible talks about two different gods? One is a God with small g and the other is a God with capital G. A small g God and a big g God. You don't believe me? Okay, let me read this to you. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. This comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Now that is the God with small g. Who is this God? Jesus describes him as the ruler of the world. This is what Jesus said in John, I think, 1430. For the ruler of this world is coming. He has no power over me. Now, there is this scene uh, in the gospel story where the small g God comes to Jesus, who is actually the big g God, and he comes with a proposal. Let me read that to you. And it is from Luke chapter 4, 6 and seven and the devil said to him that is another name for this god of the world or the god with small g by the way i will give you all this domain and its glory for it has been handed over to me interesting the small g god says he became the ruler of the world because the power has been handed over to him. By whom? Who gave him power and authority? Who made him the God of the world? In order to answer that question, we have to go back to the very beginning of the Bible, the first three chapters, Genesis 1 to 3. This is where we read about a theological proposition called the fall, the fall, okay? And you know the story of uh, Genesis 1 to 3. I'll give you the crux of the story, which I'm sure you know very well. In the beginning, God created the world and appointed man as the ruler of the earth. When we say man, in the in biblical language it really means humanity women included all right just wanted you to know uh, this is what we read in genesis chapter 1 verses 27 
and 28. God created man in his own image and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over it. So technically speaking, God made man the ruler of the world. God with small g. Are you following me? But then... As the story goes, he met a friend who is described as the serpent. The serpent said to man, why do you want to be just a small G God? You know, you can become a big G God. Huh. So man thought that's a great idea. So he ate or both of them, she and him, you know, the man, humanity, ate the forbidden fruit and fell from the glory of God. As a result, the earth became cursed and the serpent assumed the control of the fallen world. In other words, we handed over the scepter of power, the dominion to the serpent, which was originally given to us by God. Now, I know many people, including Christians, write this off as a cute Santa school story, some kind of a fairy tale, you know. Uh, you hardly hear pastors preaching from Genesis 1 to 3. And we have outsourced it all to Sunday school teachers. But I'll tell you one thing. Whether you take this as a literal event or as a figurative metaphor or something like that, it is... It is one of the most foundational texts of the Bible which explains the most profound theological truths like the creation of the universe, the origin of life, and the entry of sin, suffering, and evil into the world. Obviously, our puny little mind cannot comprehend this complex spiritual reality, so it is told to us in the form of a story. Again, you can take literally or figuratively but it is no fairy tale. Let me tell you that. Now, here is an interesting fact for you. The Garden of Eden story is found not only in Christianity, it is also in the sacred texts of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. In the Bible, which obviously is the same Bible the Jews and the Christians read, the Jews it is Torah, uh, but the Quran is the sacred text of um, Islam, you probably know that. Uh, but even in the Quran, the story is very similar, if not the same. There are some added details. But for the Jews and the Muslims, what happened in the Garden of Eden was nothing more than an unfortunate incident, a one-time event. Adam and Eve ate a fruit they were not supposed to eat. And God punished them for it and threw them out of the garden and everybody moved on. End of story. That's it. But for Christians though, this event has an eternal spiritual significance. Okay, this is very important. In Romans 5.12, let me read Romans 5.12 to you. Just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I know, I know there is so much to take in. Um, let me summarize this for you, you know, the, the encapsulation of, of or the key theme here. What it says is that the Garden of Eden story is really about a mystical event we call the fall through which sin entered the world and it is the origin of evil and death which is the ultimate form of suffering. So death is the ultimate form of suffering. Now let me unpack this a bit. Uh, first of all, you know, why should we all bear the responsibility of one man's sins? That's what the Jews and the Muslims would ask. And, and it's a fair question, logically speaking. 
Um, here is the difference though. A big difference. Adam was not just another man. He was the first man, the primordial man. Therefore, when Adam was cursed, whatever happened to his spiritual and physical DNA affected all his descendants, which means the whole of humanity. We all carry different kinds of genetic predispositions uh, passed on to us by our ancestors, right? Like you know, we all have genetic uh, uh, issues, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a matter of heredity. And it may seem unfair, but there are many instances in our own life where we share collective responsibility for the sins of others. Uh, for example, you know, when you uh, go to purchase an auto insurance policy, uh, if your age is between 18 and 25, your premium would be way higher than that of somebody like me who is slightly uh, above that age group, uh, right? The insurance industry penalizes you as a young person for the collective sins committed by the people in your age group, even though you probably are a better driver than I am. And in the same way, your insurance premium can go up or down when you move from one zip code to the other. Again, based on the collective sins committed by the people in that area. It, it is a simple fact of life. So the collective responsibility is not that hard to understand. We are, it is part of our daily life in so many different ways. Now, the theology of the fall, as we read in Romans 5.12, says that death entered the world through the original sin in the Garden of Eden, and it eventually spread throughout the world like a spiritual pandemic. Remember, the first thing that happened when Adam and Eve ate the fruit was that they realized they were naked. Um, it is like a, a, glowing, a glowing electric bulb suddenly being switched off. Do you remember uh, one of those transparent bulbs from the old days? Um, I think incandescent lamps, we call them. Uh, when it is lit, all you see is a bright light. But when switched off, it becomes naked, so to speak. Uh, suddenly, you can see through it, everything inside, the filament, the, the glass pieces and the wires and, and all the ugly stuff become visible. And Genesis 1-3 says that something similar happened to humanity in the primeval time. There was a rebellion against God. Our desire to become God with a capital G that caused us to fall from our original uh, glorious existence. The divine, com the, 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 the divine content departed from our body. A fundamental change happened to the nature of our being, our disposition. And we fell from the realm of eternity to the realm of time. That is what is really happening in the Garden of Eden. Whether, again, whether you read it literally or figuratively, that is the real story in Genesis chapter 1 to 3. Now, as I mentioned before, the theology of fall is a very unique concept in Christianity as it alludes to how our body became prone to uh, sickness, decay, and death. No other religions talk about this concept of fall, including uh, Judaism and, uh, and Islam, even though re they read the same story, uh, pretty much in the same way, or the, from the same text. Um, so, you know, let me, let me take it another, another direction, say, the, to, to understand the relevance of the, the story of the fall. Imagine we see a little girl born crippled. And when you see someone like that, don't you wonder what God was thinking when he created her? Right? Is it like God made this beautiful little girl in her mother's womb and then he thought, hmm, 
let me have some fun and twist her legs like a little bit, right? I mean, is that what happened? Is that how God makes people? Isn't God responsible for her creation in that way? And obviously, when a child is born with an infirmity, there is no one else to be blamed other than God, right? Because we believe we are all created by God, including me and you and that crippled girl. But if you really read the Bible, God is done creation in Genesis chapter 1. God is finished with creation in Genesis chapter 1. He did six days of creation. Once again, literal or figurative, it doesn't matter to the meaning of the story. Okay, So he has not done any creation after that because on the seventh day he rested from creation. What does that mean? God did not create you or me or that crippled girl in the technical sense of the word creation. What he does in the world right now is not creation, but procreation. There is a very, very important difference between creation and procreation. In the creation story, we see God making everything with seeds of its kind. That's what Genesis 1, 11 says. Everything had uh, seeds of its kind in them so that they can procreate by themselves. Right? In the same way, he created the first human and established a system of procreation to create the rest of humanity. That is how the rest of the creation happens in, 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 in our case. But in the fall, the human seed or our DNA got corrupted and the procreation system was compromised. You know, this is a little hard for you to take in all at once. So let me give you <clears throat> another example. Um, when I was in university, I used to work for a printed circuit board manufacturing facility. Um, our production line was designed and installed by Siemens AG, one of the top technology brands in the world. And the whole process was completely automatic. A printed board will pass through a conveyor belt. A robotic arm will, place, uh, will kind of place all the necessary components on the surface of the board, which will then go through another unit where it will be soldered to perfection. So it was like a seamless process. But I remember pretty much every shift, at least a few dozen boards will come out of the unit completely twisted and warped. It is because of the wrong placement of the components on the circuits, you know, which is etched on the board. But how can the robot make a mistake? We know that the computers never make mistakes, right? The problem was always with the operator who caused the software into the machine when we switch from one design to the other. Each time when you change the design of the circuit uh, board, you know, when you run a new batch, you have to change the program. The coding has to be changed. And we used to work 12 hour night shifts and all of us were dead tired and sleepy. So the fatigue caused a human error. Very often we forgot to change the coding, which resulted in a malfunctioning robot and eventually the damaged product. But you cannot blame the manufacturer of the machine for this mishap, right? They created the best possible machines and established the best production process which ensures a seamless operation. But the problem is that the program got corrupted which messed up the end product. Now, just as the manufacturer of the machine is not responsible for the damaged product, God cannot be held responsible for the crippled child or a blind Matthew. You know, if I take this off, I can hardly see anything, you know. So I have my own genetic 
uh, predisposition which was passed on from my parents or we all have some kind of infirmity or the corruption of DNA uh, or our, uh, 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 the corruption of our body as part of the process we call fall. We are all products of a biological conveyor belt run by a malfunctioning DNA. That is essentially the premise of the theology of the fall, which is found only in Christianity and not in any other religions. Now, Genesis 1 to 3 also talks about some side effects, or I would say aftershocks to the fall of humanity. The fall not only disconnected the relationship between man and God, but it also disrupted the harmony between man and nature. Man and nature. Cursed is the ground because of you. That's what it says uh, in Genesis 3.17. God curses the earth. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. Now this curse has caused an enmity between man and nature. Because it was not just the man that was fallen, but nature went down with him. Paul says in Romans that the creation is groaning for its redemption. Romans 8, 19 to 22, if you have time, you should read it. And it says, nature waits with eager longing so that it will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom. So that means nature is also waiting for the redemption because it was also fallen with humanity in Genesis chapter 1 to 3. Uh, let me use an, another analogy to explain this. Uh, I have heard this analogy. I think I, I, think I read it in, uh, in, in, in a book anyway. Um, uh, imagine an electromagnet. Okay. When an electric current passes through the coils of the electromagnet, it produces a magnetic flux and it attracts, uh, say, an iron ring. And, and, it is, and, and it is hanging from the magnet because the magnet attracts the, electri uh, the, the electric ring and, and it, is, you know, it, is, uh, uh, it is stuck on the magnet and it is hanging from the magnet. Uh, because the iron ring is in contact with the magnet, you know, once the iron ring connects to the magnet, it also becomes magnetized and attracts another iron ring. So now you have the magnet and an iron ring hanging from the magnet and another iron ring hanging from that iron ring. So you can have any number of iron rings hanging like this in a chain, you know, like a chain, depending on the power of the magnet. Now, if I cut off the electric supply, the magnet loses its power, which will immediately separate the iron ring from the magnet and also from each other, right? You know, so, so the entire system, the entire ring of, of, of the iron, you know, the chain collapses. And that is exactly what happened in the fall. When we fell from the glory of God, our power source got cut off. We lost the glory of God, which disrupted the harmony between man and God, man and man, and man and nature. So what happens is that just like we rebelled against God, nature is also rebelling against us in groaning. That's what Romans says, right? The natural, the, the, the natural calamities we see in the world in a spiritual sense can be perceived as the tremors of this groaning of the earth for its redemption. All these calamities we see and we assume as natural evil could be a product of the fallen nature uh, groaning and, and grumbling or complaining against us or rebelling against us. And that is what we learn from the theology of the fall. Now, <clears throat> the only role the God of the Bible may have played in this tragedy of human suffering 
is that he gave us free will. In a way, free will is the real root of all the evils, right? As you can see, evil was never created, but it stemmed from the moral decisions of the agents of free will, whether it is man or the devil. It all starts with the free will decision to rebel against God. And this is the problem with free will. God cannot give us power to make morally right choices without also giving us the power to make morally wrong choices. So that is the conundrum if you need free will. In other words, God cannot eliminate the possibility of moral evil arising from free will without eliminating the possibility of moral good also. Then we must ask, why did God give us free will? Especially if he knew that we are going to mess this up, right? The answer to that question to me is pretty simple. A four letter word called love, love. Can you imagine a world without love? A world with no romance, no poetry, no creativity, no humanity. A loveless world is not a world at all. But it is the ability to love and being loved is what makes us human. Would you agree that? Do you want to live in a world there is no love? But here is the problem. True love cannot exist without the possibility of being rejected. See, if I create a robot, for example, and and program it to love me, whatever that means, it cannot be love at all. Love cannot exist without free will. So the choice in front of God was pretty straightforward. Create a loveless world where everything can be under his control, which will be a suffering free world, of course, or create a world with love, which will naturally entail suffering caused by our power to make free will decision. There is no other way. See, a good way to eliminate all the sufferings in the world is to eliminate our free will, which will also eliminate all love. But to eliminate love would be to eliminate the essence of life. You see God's predicament? In the end, in my opinion, God made the best possible world which has an optimum level of both love and suffering. They have to coexist. And then he decided to perform a delicate balancing act between them. Man's free will decisions cause random acts of evil and suffering in the world. But then God provides a redemptive meaning to that suffering. He can redeem even the worst kind of suffering, the most senseless act of evil, and provided a redemptive meaning. That is what he proved on the cross of Christ. The cross is the sign of Christianity's promise of a redemptive meaning to human suffering. See, that's the question we are going to deal with next week. How can God himself suffer? It is one thing to talk about human suffering, but, but how can Christians say that God himself suffers and even dies. Let's talk about it next week. God bless.